Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Welcome to my second attempt at this exact stream. Uh, this is my coverage of ULA's Atlas V launch, and a, uh, this is going to be an exciting launch because it's the biggest, baddest, most amazing Atlas V. It's the Atlas V in the 551 configuration. Now, before we move on, the thing that I tried to do about three minutes ago and about destroyed my entire life, um, check this out, guys. I'm going to try to train you guys on this. <laughs> okay. Uh, so if you ever want a rundown before the launches, because people always ask me, what time is the launch going to start? What time is this? What kind of rocket? Are they doing this? Are they doing that? Are they doing this or that? Well, look, you can go to this website called everydayastronaut.com, click on pre-launch previews, and then voila, right here, you're going to see a countdown for all upcoming launches. Check this out. If you hover it over, it'll even show in your local time when the start window ends. Click on it, and you're going to get even more info. So how great is this? So check this out. So what? So ULA tonight, which is United Launch Alliance, that's Lockheed Martin Boeing's venture uh, company, they're launching an Air Force uh, communication satellite. This is a really high fidelity. Um, it's the fourth version of the satellite being launched. I think there's two more to be launched next year, uh, replacing a pretty old communication satellite system uh, that is used by the uh, by the Air by the U.S. military. And uh, so yes, so. The Atlas has a naming configuration, and it goes number, number, number. So Atlas 5, and then you're always going to see a bunch of numbers, and sometimes a letter. Uh, I'll talk about it in a second. But the Atlas 551 is supposed to launch tonight, so that's a 5-meter fairing, the bigger fairing. It's five solid rocket boosters, so its total thrust is like three times greater at liftoff than it would be without solid rocket boosters. Those solids produce a ton of thrust. Um, it's really 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 a very different rocket when it has those those solids going on um and then it has a single centaur upper stage a single rl10 engine on the upper stage this is the atlas 5 is the same rocket that's going to be flying 2019 it's going to have people on top of it on the boeing cst100 starliner and that will be flying in what's known as an n22 configuration so that's n not a fairing so n uh two solid rocket boosters and then two rl10 upper stage engines and the reason they need two is so they don't have to do as much of a lofted trajectory um they can kind of just it makes it so they have more aboard opportunities actually don't really want to go super far into this but this rocket tonight is launching from their east coast launch complex slick 41 um space launch complex 41 it's a pretty reasonably uh i don't know actually that's a pretty that's not a reasonable size. That's a big old 6,100 kilograms, almost 6,200 kilograms. That's almost uh, 13 and a half thousand pounds heading out to geostationary transfer orbit. Um, and of course, uh, the Atlas V is not recoverable. Um, it'll crash into the ocean. I need to change that to say it'll crash into the ocean or land like all other expendable rockets because in Russia and China, they just into Kazakhstan or in the middle of the land in China. Yep, no fairing recovered. Um, this is the 79th flight of an Atlas V, 9th in the 551 configuration, 50th launch for United Launch Alliance, launching for U.S. Air Force, 8th um, mission for the United Launch Alliance in 2018, so they really haven't launched that much this year. Um, 131st mission overall for United Launch Alliance since forming in December of 20, in 2006. So they have had an insanely amazing record. Um, I want to, so let me tell you guys something here real quick before we go on. Um, I'm working, so I had so many people, uh, first off, Chris, thank you. And also RCDJ, how are you doing? Long time no see RCDJ. Thank you guys for your tips and for saying hi. But I want to, um, um, I, I, people are saying that the stream is for some reason unlisted, but it shouldn't be. And also we have the, um, we do have the, um, the launch getting ready over here, but I'm going to keep talking here real quick. We're going to keep this just kind of in the background. Um, so I'll let you guys know when it gets closer. So, um, sorry. Okay. So here's a few things that I wanted to talk about. I had a lot of people, um, coming to me going, Hey, where's your coverage on the Soyuz launch? Where's your coverage on the failure on the failure on the failure? I'm trying really hard to not just be breaking news. Um, I'm trying to do more evergreen things, but I'm going to tr treat opportunities like this to talk about some of those things um, a little more in depth. So when, if you guys want up-to-date news on what exactly happened, I'm not going to sit there and rumor monger. If I had made a video five minutes after it, it happened, I would have told you stuff that's already outdated now. And I don't want to do that. I'd rather, my focus is more on education 
and less on like breaking journalism. Um, I say that while I was exclusively covering <laughs> some breaking journalism for with Rocket Lab with their new factory down in New Zealand. Um, that's different to me. That's like a I, I don't want to just sit here at my house or in a hotel in New Zealand and try to figure out what's going on in Russia that is we don't have that much information on. To me, that's that's besides the point. You know, let's wait until we have all the information. Eventually, I'll probably use that example in an upcoming informational video about Launch Abort, why Launch Abort's good, and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, um, so people are saying that the stream's unlisted. But I don't know why that would be. It shows as public here. I will switch it real quick just to make sure. And YouTube's having some problems today, aren't they? They are really having some problems. Um, so they are holding. That's okay. They go into a T minus four minute hold. Um, and actually, we got a little bit, a little bit longer than that too. Um, so let me see if that if that worked. If you guys are seeing it as unlisted. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about here tonight, real quick, I'm going to pull this back up. I'm going to make this big screen. So um, th this is another thing that we learned in the past week, that Blue Origins or Blue Origins BE4 engine is going to be used on... Wait, we learned that a few weeks ago. That's that's really exciting. But we learned that, that the Vulcan rocket that will replace eventually the Atlas V uh, got a lot of extra funding from the government. And same with Blue Origin and also uh, North of Grumman with their Omega rocket. Um, that's very good. This this is an, the engine they're going to be using. It's a methane powered engine, a lot like uh, you know, a lot like what SpaceX is doing uh, with their Raptor engine. This is a lot bigger though. This thing is freaking huge. Look at the turbo pump machinery on this thing. That is like, oh my word, that is some crazy stuff. It's really exciting. I'm really excited to see uh, the Vulcan fly. They're saying that's going to fly already in 2020, so we only have to wait like a year and a half now. So I'm very, very excited. So, um, okay, so let's let's go back to, uh, and then Vulcan, yeah, this is the Vulcan rocket that, that, that will, they'll be replacing the Atlas V. Um, it's going to be really powerful, really versatile. Um, yeah. All right, so let's go back to the, the ULA launch. So they're going through just kind of a little, a little thing here. I'll, I'll go ahead and let you guys listen. I want to listen in for a little bit. See what we're going to hear and learn about. It's the booster stage. The vehicle now weighs a little more than 7% of what it did at liftoff. At 4 minutes 43 seconds, the first Centaur main engine burn begins, sending the Centaur into a circular orbit. At 11 minutes 51 seconds, cutoff of the Centaur main engine, or Miko 1, occurs. The Centaur main engine is restarted for a second burn at 22 minutes 25 seconds, placing Centaur on its path to spacecraft separation. Approximately six minutes later, second cutoff of the Centaur main engine occurs. The mission now enters a three-hour coast phase. The main engine ignites for a third and final burn at three hours 28 minutes. At three hours 30 minutes, the final main engine cutoff occurs. Three hours, 32 minutes, 49 seconds into flight, Centaur releases the United States Air Force AEHF-4 on its mission to provide communications to high-priority military users on the ground, at sea, and in the air. So, just for a reference, I'm not going to stream all the way through that last burn up at geostationary orbit. Uh, I'm not staying up that late. I'm still on super weird schedule. I just got back from... Um, I just got back from New Zealand last night really late, so my time clock is all sorts of messed up right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm definitely not going to stay up for the <laughs> next, like, three, three hours. Um, oh, yeah, people are asking about the MOVA globes. Like always, I should just have a little sign up that says, these are MOVA globes, M-O-V-A globes.com. Um, so, yeah, so, oh, they're, no, oh, they're just talking about Atlas V, but let's listen in. It's protected during ascent by a Ruach 5 meter diameter payload fairing. On October 5th, the encapsulated payload was transported to the vertical integration facility. Nope, I'm going to talk. You know what I think is really cool about this fairing, and it's really interesting. It's something that I've always kind of wondered why, you know, why more companies don't do it. But notice the 5 meter fairing actually attaches to the first stage of the vehicle, and it actually ejects before main engine cutoff. So it ejects, I think, like three or so minutes into flight, um, about a full minute or a minute and a half or two minutes or so before the main engine cuts off, before that um, that RD-180 cuts off. And I think that's really, really cool. Uh, I, I just think that's different. Like, shed that weight as soon as possible. Basically, as soon as you get 
uh, out of the atmosphere as soon as your you know pressure and heating uh, from the, the you know the, the, once the fairing's not needed, get rid of it. I learned I didn't realize that uh, at least some companies um, use ablative paint on the fairing too. The, the fairing actually gets that hot on a scent um, from all the you know the the compressed air that it also needs abl ablative heating uh, or paint, which I did not realize. That's really really cool. Um, the sorry, I'm just trying to read all this stuff. So. Um, yeah, so I think that's a really cool idea, and that's one of those th things that a lot of people have kind of wondered, you know, with, uh, you know, why didn't SpaceX try just attaching, just attaching the the payload fairing to the first stage of their booster, letting go of the second stage and, and having them close back up and return with the booster? Um, I'm sure there's a very good reason for it. I'm sure it cuts into payload mass quite a bit. Um, nothing's ever... If you ever say, why don't they just... There's a really, really good reason. If you have the word just, it means that it's something pretty crazy and some reason why they don't just do it. You know, there's always very complicated reasons. Um, I learned actually a lot. I, I, I got to sit and have a like an 80 minute conversation with Peter Beck, the CEO and founder of Rocket Lab Walls in New Zealand. And I just nerded out with him and asked him so many questions. I got a ton of really cool things answer that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to talk to with too many um, actual rocket scientists of that caliber. Um, it was an awesome conversation. I'll have that live, um, I think by the end of this week, uh, exclusive for Patreon members first, by the way. Uh, we're I don't know if I even mentioned that yet to my Discord channel or my Patreon members. So it'll be exclusive first to Discord members, um, and then it'll become public a public link. I'm going to do a couple videos about my time down at Rocket Lab. Um, yeah, I'm really excited for that company, but uh, I, I think one of the next people I need to talk to is I need to talk to Tori Bruno here from ULA. Uh, I just listened to a po one of my favorite podcasts is called Are We There Yet with Brendan Byrne out of uh, Orlando and WMF WMFE Studios, and he just had a really good sit-down interview with Tori Bruno, and I thought it was just awesome. I really like Tori. I really like... Uh, he's an actual rocket scientist as well. Uh, he started his career as a rocket scientist, literally building rockets. And he is fantastic. So um, I think I need to do a sit down with him for sure. Um, I uh, Launchpad Astronomy, uh, I went to Rocket Lab last week. Um, for those of you unfamiliar here, I actually had the first pictures um, ever, basically, inside Rocket Labs. Uh, at the time, it was secret. Um, I got in there the day before they announced it. And got to take a whole bunch of pictures down in New Zealand here um, of Rocket Lab's brand new rocket factory. Um, it was really, really, really cool. Um, they're announcing really soon their next launch site, which will be awesome. Um, I'm really, really excited about that. Um, it's, it'll be in the U.S. too, by the way. And I love these wheels. Look at these omnidirectional wheels, by the way, guys. Ah! <laughs> I have those on video. I can't wait. I will be showing you guys all about these rockets um, this week. So... Yeah. Okay, back to this. And the memory, oh, I love that they dedicate rockets to employees and and people. Yeah. ...knowledge, but more importantly, to his character. Fred was a caring, happy, fun, and humorous individual, dedicated to his career and especially his family and friends. He used his artistic ability to volunteer for ULA events and had a booming laugh that could brighten the entire team. Well-respected and loved across ULA, Fred was always willing to lend a hand or teach someone something new. Fred loved launching rockets and was the consummate rocket scientist, and he will be missed across the launch community where he left an amazing legacy. That's awesome. Well, cheers, Fred. This one's for you. I think that's so cool they do that. Man, imagine being his family right now. You know, that is Shortly after MLP an amazing to pad. off we had the opportunity to hear from Brigadier General Chess, commander of the 45th Space Wing. Let's take a look. So what else do you guys have questions about? I feel like you guys tune in to me to really get some kind of behind the scenes answers and stuff. Let me know what, what things you want us to talk about specifically right now um, that, are, that are exciting. Again, I think one of the reasons that I'm most excited about this rocket is you can actually see in the shot here on the left, um, you can see the crew access tower there. Uh, and so people will be riding on this thing Hopefully in less than a year. I, I like to think we're 
I think we're about nine months out. If 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 you were to if I were to bet, I'm guessing it'd be about nine months. And I really really hope that's true. Um, by the way, yes, for those wondering, this is live. Um, some of these are pre-recorded things, but the rocket is on the pad. We're in a T minus four minute hold. Uh, which will probably be released in about five minutes. So ULA does these pre-planned holds where they go through systems checks and stuff like that. Once they get into that, after that T minus four minute hold, that's when they basically do an automated countdown sequence and they let the, the computer do it. That's quite different than SpaceX who does like almost the entire thing is automated from like for a long ways out. Um, ULA does a, a few more systems checks uh, just by looking at it first. And then they basically commit to launch at a certain time. One of the things that's unique about ULA, I think, I, I need to get more. This is one of those things I really want to drill in when I when I ask uh, Tori Bruno some questions someday. Would be, I believe they literally, for every single payload they launch, they literally map out every second of launch opportunity. What would have to happen for, that's why they have, they can oftentimes not only have pretty long windows, like two, four hours, but they literally like customize the exact payload and the exact orbital parameters for every second throughout the entire hold. And it's a lot of math and a lot of uh, calculations. Um, single versus two engine config for the upper stage. Yeah, so um, Archduke Tyler wants to know um, a little bit more about the RL-10, the dual RL-10 Centaur upper stage. That will be first flying, the, it's flown many, many, many times before. The, RL, the dual RL-10 Centaur upper stage was pretty common, I think. With I think it first flew on Atlas three. Uh, it, it also flew on the space shuttle as a as a dual RL ten configuration. I think I want people to fact check that um, when you guys have a chance. Um, oh, RC DJ's back in our Discord. Howdy, RC DJ. It's been a while. Um, ooh, I want to listen to this. Pulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. Water. Go. Centaur systems propulsion. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. LH2. Go. Has gas. Go. Electrical systems airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. GCQ. Go. Operation support. Go. Com. Go. Umbilicals. Go. ECS. Go. Redline monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Op safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. LD is go. The launch vehicle is ready to launch. Mission director. This is the mission director. You have permission to launch. Proceed with the count. ALC, verify T0 is set for 04 colon 15 Zulu. Verified. Here we go. Get ready. They're going to come out of this hold here. Polling is complete, and the launch team has given the go for launch. From T minus four minutes until launch, you will be listening to launch conductor Ed Kitta and his team performing the final steps in the countdown procedure. You will hear the team call out that Atlas LO2 topping has been secured followed about a minute later by the call-out for transferring the Atlas and Centaur stages from ground facility power to internal battery power. At T minus 1 minute and 55 seconds, the team will command the launch sequencer to start, followed shortly by securing the Centaur LH2 and LO2 topping activity. At T minus 1 minute and 40 seconds, the team will command the flight control system to launch enable and arm the flight termination system. In the final minute, the Atlas tanks will be verified at flight pressures, followed by verification of Centaur tank pressures. A final status check of Atlas, Centaur, and AEHF-4 readiness is connect conducted at T-25 seconds. At T-3 seconds, the RD-180 engine will roar to life. So, uh, I really quick want to answer Renau Gaming's question about the Soyuz abort. What do I think will happen with the crew? And thank you, Renau, by the way. Uh, do I think another Soyuz will be launched before the current... Uh, is past its use by date. If not, will the crew leave the station un, uh, uncrewed? That's a really good question. Um, I'm still waiting to hear kind of the official status on that because it's it's one of those things. Uh, I don't know if they'll. I don't know what they'll do because uh, rumor has it they might be able to just fly up um, an uncrewed Soyuz up, which um, they were planning. 
Oh, here we go. We're, we're getting out of getting into this ten Three, or down to the four minute two, hold here. One. Listen, here we go. Mark. There we go. Okay, so four minutes. So basically, um, uh, they wanted to test an uncrewed Soyuz rendezvous and docking with the ISS at some point in the near future. Um, I think like next year. So it sounds like this might be their opportunity to go ahead and do that. Um, if not, if they can't get another one up there to extend the crew's, uh, the crew's, you know, date on on station, they will probably have to come down, and the, and the station will have to be uncrewed. That's about all I know for now. We'll see. Um, I'm waiting to really get solid figures, and because th I don't, guys, honestly, I don't know that much about ISS turnarounds and things like that. Um, I do have a, a friend that I, I could email right now, uh, flight director. Uh, I've got a couple different people that I could probably ask, and, and I might have to. Uh, Bob Dempsey would be a really good one. My friend Anthony would be another really good one. Um, I would love to hear those options, and maybe I'll do that. I've got so much stuff to do lately, guys. It's insane. Uh, and thank you, Andrew. Um, um, so, yeah, um, the dual uh, people are talking about the, the dual engine, uh, engine Centaur. has definitely flown before, but it's never flown... Maybe it's never, it's definitely never flown on the Atlas V. I, I would love to know if someone knows uh, which exactly. Um, the half blind astronomer wants to know my thoughts on the Air Force's, uh, the EELV announcement. So basically, um, they awarded three pretty big contracts to Blue Origin, ULA, and um, Northrop Grumman for the Omega rocket. It's no surprise. Apparently, um, SpaceX did actually uh, get, get a bid in for use of BFR potentially, or. I think BFR, um, but the Air Force was not interested in that uh, yet. Um, but that being said, the uh, you know it, it's really meant for development. These are, are development contracts, and SpaceX already has rockets that are developed that are able to fulfill these contracts. Why would they need to get more funding for that development? Um, that's kind of my, my main thoughts. I'm ha really happy about Blue Origin getting money for a West Coast launch pad. That's really cool. Um, Personally, I'm not. Personally, I'm not hugely excited about uh, Omega Rocket. It just doesn't excite me. Um, Vulcan excites me more. Um, but here we go. We're getting down to a minute thirty. So thank you, uh, the Half Line Astronomer and Alex. T Here's five five one for the five five one launch. Thank you. Well, thanks, Alex. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Okay, In Eastern go. Range, our go for launch. Dang, they're gonna go off right at the opening of the window. I think. One twenty. OCU's armed. SVF count started. 115. Reduce ECS for launch. Roger. Yes. 110. Pent valves locked. T minus one minute. One minute. Rock there we go. Report range status. Range green. And it's green. Uh, friendly reminder: I'm seeing people ask about the smoke pouring off the rocket. It's that is not smoke. There is a there is what looks like a fire over there. Um, that's normal. That's hydrogen burn off from the tank. They purposefully vent it and burn off the excess. Um, but then this, what you're seeing on the rocket, this is looking down the rocket. You're seeing condensation pouring off the rocket. Um, this rocket, especially the upper stage, that hydrogen tank is crazy cold, like minus hundreds of degrees. Uh, same with the the liquid oxygen tank. Oh. ECS reduced for launch. Roger. Status hmm. check. They got rid of the Go countdown. Ahead. Go Centaur. Go AHF. Board. But it's it's actually just really, really cold. Uh, it's it's air with with moisture in the air. You know, uh, humidity Minus. coming in contact with a really Nine, really cold uh, eight, rocket. Here we go. Seven, six, five, four, three. We have ignition. Two, one. And liftoff yes. of the AEHF-4 mission carried by United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket <laughs> for the United States Air Force. Oh man. I wish I was down there right now. It's gonna be a fun one to see. And hear and feel. Now 20 seconds in a flight. He's gonna close with control. You are hearing the voice of Patrick Moore providing launch vehicles. Now passing 30 eight. seconds in a flight. Mach 1, Atlas 5, now supersonic. Now passing 40 seconds in the flight. And we're experiencing a uh, temperature dropout in the uh, Denver data station. At this point in the flight, 
RD-180 should be throttling back up to 100% thrust, passing through max Q. Now passing one minute into flight. Go ahead. We have to continue to stop right normally during the set. Okay, everything's Back good. To 100% thrust as expected. So it throttled down a little bit for as it goes through the and VOC, I have data now. As it receives the most aerodynamic pressure on the vehicle. Um, now one minute, 25 seconds into flight, Atlas V rocket now weighs just one half of what it did at launch, burning propellant at a rate of 6,900 pounds per second. That's now one crazy. minute, 34 seconds into flight. Look at that. And we so, have burnout on all five SRBs. So they're going to be jettisoned here in a second. RD-180 throttling back up to full thrust. One minute, 45 seconds into flight. Here we go. One minute, 50 seconds in. Boom. Bye-bye. And we have jettison of all five solid rocket boosters. You can see them glowing now, now as they fall away. two minutes into flight. Vehicle is now on cruise loop steering. And vehicle is now passing Mach 5. Looking good. Now two minutes, ten seconds into flight. RD-180 pump speeds and injector pressures look good in the uh, full thrust mode. Now two minutes, twenty-five seconds in, approximately two minutes remaining in the Atlas booster phase of flight. Launch vehicle is now forty-two miles in altitude. <laughs> 81 miles downrange distance, traveling at 5,800 miles per hour. Dang. Two minutes, 40 seconds into flight. And RD-180 is now throttling to maintain a 2.5G acceleration limit. Engine response and vehicle acceleration response looks good. Centaur reaction control system is now pressurizing the flight levels. Two minutes, 57 seconds in. Now three minutes into flight. Atlas V is now 63 miles in altitude, 137 miles downrange distance, traveling so at 7,500 so miles per hour. Past the Carmen line, past that 62 miles, 100 and kilometers in altitude. And injector pressures on the RD-180 look good as they're, as they're uh, throttling to maintain that 2.5G acceleration limit. And remember, it's going pretty much sideways now. It's Approximately one minute remaining to Beco, standing by for payload fairing jettison. There we go. And we have good indication payload of payload fairing, fairing jettison. That's good. Whoa. And we have CFLR oh, yeah, jettison. Now three minutes, 40 seconds into flight. Vehicle now throttling to 95% thrust. So don't forget, you know, rockets only go up to really get out of the atmosphere. That's the only reason and a rocket has to go up. now throttling to maintain a constant 4.6 um, G acceleration limit. So the only yeah, so let, let me say this again. The only reason a rocket really goes up at all is to get out of the atmosphere. In order to actually, and that will get you into space, sure. But if you if you just go straight up and kiss the edge of space, say you know 100 kilometers, you're gonna fall right back down. In order to stay in space, you have to go sideways, really, really, really fast. If you did that here at sea level, <laughs> if you got up to 17,500 miles an hour, what is it, 27,000 kilometers an hour? Um, if you if you did that at sea level, I don't care what it's made out of. It's it's going to overheat, um, and it's going to explode from all the pressure. Um, so you have to get up out of the atmosphere, so there's no additional forces against you, no aerodynamic pressure. Here we go. Standing by for ignition. And we have ignition on the RL10. Chamber pressure looks good. Vehicle body rate response looks good. Nice. This is the first burn of today's mission. This first burn should last approximately six minutes. RL-10 appears to be performing well. Chamber pressure looks good. Vehicle body rates uh, also looking good. Now passing the RL-10, minutes, by the way, this, this upper flight. stage is crazy, 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 crazy efficient. It's like over 400 uh, seconds of, of specific impulse. It's... Still one of the best upper stage engines ever made. Uh, it's it's very efficient. Um, hydrogen makes for a really good upper stage engine. Um, it's it's easy to get a high specific impulse out of out of a hydrogen engine. It's it's pretty hard though to get a, a high thrust to weight ratio um, out of hydrogen. But the, it makes for a great great upper stage. Our next event, Centaur main engine cutoff, will occur in approximately seven minutes. So we have seven minutes until it's just in its parking orbit. I'm joined now by Major um, Matthew Getz from the U.S. Air Force 
so I'm going to listen in here. I, I have a few people to talk to here real quick. Um, first off, dude, uh, thank you for the colonization of Mars. Uh, do I think that SpaceX will build spaceships that stay in space with more efficient engines like in the movie The Martian or other companies and agencies? So basically, kind of like how right now there's the, um, the cis lunar uh, – or the, the the lunar orbiting platform or the, the lunar orbiting gateway is definitely a hot topic right now. And it, it makes sense. Um, I don't see SpaceX being too into that. I think they're just going to make a really big rocket called the BFR. And I think that's their plan is to really just land a bunch on, on the surface of Mars, have some there before humans would ever go there. But eventually it does actually make sense to basically build a giant, giant, giant ship in space. I think um, it, it does. It saves you, you know, I don't know, though, actually, uh, you know, technically, if you, you know, say you put like ion thrusters or xeon thrusters on something like that, um, it can be quite a bit more efficient, you know, to, to do your Mars transits and things. But you still have to launch a vehicle to rendezvous with it. And that vehicle has to, without the, you know, cruise ship basically slowing all the way down and getting into orbit and then slowing all the way down to get into Mars orbit and doing all that back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, there's no really good way to, to do that. with. Uh, so then if you're not doing that and if you're just slinging around, that means the vehicle that you launch in has to get all the way to Mars anyway. It has to inject itself with enough velocity to rendezvous with a vehicle that's already going out towards Mars. So really, um, it can make sense. It just has to be done really, 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 really well. Um, and I, I just honestly don't see SpaceX wanting to have that kind of investment. But... Maybe someday, maybe in 20, 30 years, that'll be totally normal and expected to have a big, luxurious spaceship for that. So that's my guess. Um, thank you again. Chris Harris, I'm having a ULA Big Rocket MV sniffles. <laughs> it is a pretty big rocket. Don't forget, though, uh, it's about the same diameter, actually, as uh, as the Falcon 9. The Falcon 9 is just a lot taller, a lot skinnier, or a lot uh, more fine. Its ratio from width to height um, is, qu is quite a bit taller, like 20 meters taller. Um, the Atlas V is, is almost the exact same width, though. Um, Mary Smith, hi. Thank you for your amazing webcast and launch. Well, thank you, Mary. That really means a lot. I really appreciate that. Thanks for saying hi. Uh, Matthew, nothing like seeing a launch from your backyard on a clear night on the other coast of Florida and having a stream up. Dang, Matthew, that sounds awesome. Very jealous. Uh, I've never seen a rocket launch from far away. I think that'd be a lot of fun. It is crazy to me that you can see these launches from hundreds of miles away. That's, that's amazing. Um, Bosco, Bob, if you had the chance to fly to Mars with a 50% success rate each way, nope, 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 nope. I would not go. Not even close. I will wait until it's 99.9 .9 and it's like affordable. I'm definitely not like, I would even be scared to do if, if Blue Origin does, you know, if they asked me to ride on their new Shepard, which is just the little suborbital hop for 15, 20 minutes, I'd be pretty scared to do that uh, until it's flown a bunch of times. I'm not, I, I'm too old for that stuff now. You know, I, I used to be all about like a speed freak and stuff and have the fastest cars and motorcycles and stuff. And now I just, I'm too old. I, I want to, there's a lot to see down here on earth still, but all right, let's, let's look in and see what they're now. They're not even talking, <laughs> ah, but it's, everything's going well now though. Nine minutes, 30 seconds um, into flight. Pickle juice wants to know. Uh, so so, uh, Pickle Juice, we did talk about this a minute ago, actually. Um, I started off the stream kind of by saying uh, that I'm not trying to do, like, breaking news like that. Because, honestly, it can just really quickly lead to rumor mongering. Um, I could sit there and read the same things you guys would be reading and be like, yeah, they, you know, uh, both fell out. You know, some, anything that you're going to see within the first couple days is, is not a very good source. It, it, I don't want to be... I want my videos to be able to be looked back on and typically be a little bit more evergreen, you know, where it's um, where it's better and, you know, it still makes sense in six months to a year. Um, if I were to make a video the day of the Soyuz launch, it would have been full of uh, just assumptions. Um, I still don't know the impact that'll have on the International Space Station, which we just talked about a second ago. Um, there's, I, I like, like, this is the type of stuff that, I wish I, I knew the answer to, and not knowing the exact answer, I don't think it's worth my time or your time for me to just sit here and speculate. I understand that people might want my my opinions and weigh-ins on it, but 
it just can lead to misinformation. And I'd rather be, okay, once we have all the facts, maybe I'll use this as a, as a good example going forward on what Launch Abort is, how Launch Abort works, why we should do Launch Abort. And that video can be relevant for two to three years, um, you know, or five years or 10, 20, 100. In 100 years, people are going to be looking back, <laughs> watching old everyday astronaut videos about Launch Abort. Uh, but that is really my, my attitude now. I, I think this summer I chased... Um, sensationalism and, and that that style of uh, breaking news, you know, on the beat all the time. And uh, it's, I don't know, I just, I, I don't really like it that much. It, it's too, uh, yeah, it's stressful and it, it leads to potential misinformation. So so I'm kind of, I'm backing off on that a little bit. If I have a cool opportunity, like, like I said, with Rocket Lab to, to visit their new rocket factory in New Zealand, uh, before it's publicly available, yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that beat, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. But that's totally different circumstances. That's where I have all the answers to everything, and it's an, an amazing opportunity. Um, yes, then I'll write a story about it and, and get, bring bring you guys a video uh, pretty soon. So <laughs> sends another 50 to the forced, <laughs> forced him dot for Mars fund. No, don't make me do that. All right, let's make sure this is a good orbital insertion. Sent our body rates uh Stamping out nicely from the shutdown transients. Uh, now seeing uh, RCS thruster activity as expected to uh, maintain vehicle control. It's looking good. This is Atlas Mission Control at T plus 12 minutes, 22 seconds and counting. Patrick Moore just confirmed the first Centaur main engine cutoff. Our next event, main engine burn number two, will occur in approximately 10 minutes. Sweet. So we got 10 more minutes before they do their second burn, and that will loft it up into its uh, geostationary transfer orbit. So that's where um, they'll burn They'll burn along the inclination, loft it way up there to, to geostationary orbit, or to geostationary altitude. And then this will be coasting for three hours, which I will not cover. <laughs> and uh, and then they'll be doing uh, another uh, an actual, in, a full-blown insertion burn. So this is actually not just going to geostationary transfer orbit. This is going to geostationary orbit, um, which is great because it can get up into operation right away. Um, so, um, so again, thank you, Chris. And dude, uh, dude, long name. Uh, thank you for your previous response. Do you see a future where nuclear engines are often used 40 plus years, for example, reaching the gas plant as the belt? I think nuclear engines are still, I mean, we got really far along in the development of the NERVA. Um, we basically just didn't fly it. It was it had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of flight, but it just wasn't uh, wasn't flown in space. Or not hundreds of hours of hundreds of hours of testing, or, or several maybe not hundreds of hours, but hundreds of minutes of testing. Uh, it was really well tested. Everything was going really well with with the nuclear engine called Nerva, um, and it's really a shame it never flew because it could have really, really, really changed space flight. Um, yeah, so. Um, yes, I still do think that nuclear engines would be amazing for a lot of things. And yeah, for like a, a cis Martian uh, giant thing, yeah, that'd be great too. Um, yeah, that's, that's, um, that, let's see, hang on. Uh, yeah, um, so for those people um, that are, again, asking about Soyuz and things like that, if you want someone that can just literally off the cuff speculate on things and do them willy-nilly scott manley is your guy absolutely scott manley i don't want to i don't want to try to do that um we are kind of serving two different markets i've always said that my goal as a science communicator is to get people up to scott manley's uh communication level and it's not even honestly he doesn't i think he breaks it down just as well as anybody i think he's uh, really easy to understand but i i think he has a little bit for some reason people are a little bit more intimidated for some reason um, that's, and I think my, my goal is just to get people excited, um, get them educated, get them excited and get them so that they advocate for space and want more and more and more. That's my goal. And, uh, if I can answer, you know, I help want to answer all these questions along the way as humanly possible. Um, Scott Manley, on the other hand, can literally take a situation like the Soyuz thing and he just like threw out an answer basically instantly. It, it's crazy. Um, I don't quite have that capacity. Um, I, mine would be a lot more speculative than his. Um, so yeah. Um, and uh, and Abu says, uh, do I think ISRO GSLV can compare be compared with these? 
Um, yeah, uh, it can. Uh, that's a big rocket, and uh, I really need to do a video soon about uh, about the ISR, about India's space program, because it's insanely impressive. And I think if, if India ends up pursuing reusability, it could almost be game over for the space industry, because they're already launching at crazy, uh, the very high success rates and very low price. Um, so yeah, I, I think... Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm really excited for ISRO, and I, I do think, yeah, the GSLV can pretty much be compared. This is an interesting camera angle it keeps showing, by the way. I'm a little bit confused by it. Is it on a, is it on a boom, or is it a really, really, really quiet drone? <laughs> I think it's on a boom. Um, let's see. Um, sorry, I'm trying to just... Oh, that's a... Oh, yeah, I've seen that one before. That is amazing in Discord. Uh, by the way, if you guys want to join our exclusive Discord channel, uh, you just have to become a Patreon member, patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. Uh, we do have a Discord channel that's very active, a really great community. Uh, we all learn together a lot. Uh, we go back and forth on a lot of things all the time. Uh, good discussions. If you want to join our, our community, this is also uh, the... I have it up exclusively too during streams as well. We have a place just for streaming. So if you wanna if you wanna join that, if you, if you were into Discord and th other things like that, go to uh, everyday or no patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. And again, I'm sorry if I'm like low on energy. Like I said, I just got back. I had thirty what was it? Thirty six hours from leaving my hotel to getting home yesterday. Or thirty two hours. Uh I'm still so out of whack. And New Zealand was great. Uh, but yeah, uh, Andrew wants to know, how do you fast forward in this video to see what happens? Sorry. This is just a straight up live stream straight up, um, <laughs> eat spinach. Um, they, they did launch random stuff wants to know what time to do they launch. They just launched, uh, 18 minutes ago. Uh, they are in a, a small coast phase. They're going to be coasting for about probably the next five minutes or so. And then they'll do another uh, burn with their Centaur upper stage to place the satellite into its highly elliptical orbit, getting the altitude way out there to geostationary, uh, which is like 22,000 miles or something. Uh, it's like this way out here. 30-something, uh, 30 36,000 kilometers or something like that. Um, I should really know those numbers right offhand. Uh, but it's too... But it's too late, and I'm on schedule, and I can't use my brain very good right now. But nevertheless, um, okay, let's see what they're saying. Communications. Uh, Lori, thanks so much for being here. Pleasure to be here. So we talked a little bit earlier about the artwork and the international partners. Uh, can you tell me who are the industry partners? How many are there, and who are they? Sure. So there's three major partners for this advanced DHF mission the Air Force, Northrop Grumman, and of course, Lockheed Martin. So the Air Force is Lockheed Martin's customer, and we're fortunate to work these really exciting missions with SMC, and we work really closely with the Air Force as a customer. Um, Northrop Grumman is the payload provider, and Lockheed Martin, we develop and build the satellite and the ground system out of our Sunnyvale, California campus. So all of us together, and then of course you saw ULA, they put the sat satellite into orbit on the Atlas V rocket. Well, it's certainly uh, quite a team effort. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, your team in California? So Lockheed Martin has been so I'm in seeing the Bay some good Area here. the early um, days of Silicon Valley, and now there are over 4,000 employees Ooh, that's cool, Link. who are out there. That's an awesome they picture. They design from and they build 13 the miles. satellites. You live 13 miles from the Cape. I am AEHF. very jealous. Dang. And someone else, in, and uh, Mufestini uh, from St. Petersburg, Florida. Hang on, I'm going to pull these guys up here real quick. Um, I want you guys to see this. This is pretty sweet. Uh, hope this doesn't totally bonk it. My computer is hating whatever I accidentally did. Hang on, let me see if I can't pull this up. And this one. One second, guys. I'm going to get you guys some cool pictures from people in my Discord channel that, that have pictures from only a few miles away. Check this out. So this is from St. Petersburg. 
Um, this is from uh, Mufastini. Uh, I assume it's that right there from St. Petersburg, which is on the other side of Florida. That's crazy. And this is uh, from Lank, who is only 13 miles, uh, about 20 kilometers away um, from the launch. That is crazy. That actually would light up. Like, I feel like that makes it look almost like daylight there. That's crazy. Um, and St. Petersburg is about 160 miles from the Cape. That's a long ways. That's awesome. Um, hit command and tab. Let's see what that does. Hit control and tab. I, yeah. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Uh, you saw it live in Miami. It says, uh, Dayron. That is awesome. Um, yeah, it launched 20 minutes ago. We are we are currently in just a we're waiting for the rocket to get to its its coast point. Actually, you can see it in the background here. Notice back there they still have their animation showing uh, where it's at. That rendering. Whoa, Austin! Holy McDivitts! Jeez, thank you so much, Austin. Uh, Austin says you're awesome. Don't stop being awesome. We make great content. Dang, thank you, everyone. Uh, S claps for Austin. Thank you. That seriously is crazy. On a night like tonight when I'm tired and just ready to go to bed, that really that really is awesome. Uh, it's a greatly appreciated. Oh, here we go. They're doing the, the upper stage burn. So they have... We have locks pre-start on the RL-10, now standing by for ignition. <laughs> Chris wants to know when's the next launch over London, Canada. I have no idea, Chris. I'm sorry. Probably. And we have ignition on the RL-10. Chamber pressure looks good. There we Body go. Body rates look good. Engine ignition. And propellant utilization system has gone to closed loop control. System response looks good. Chamber pressure continues to look good on the RL-10. Vehicle body rates remain stable. This burn should last approximately 5 minutes, 54 seconds. A 5-minute burn. That's crazy. Now passing 23 minutes into flight. The Centaur upper stage with a single engine is pretty underpowered in a sense, but then again, the Merlin uh, vacuum engine on, on SpaceX's Falcon 9s, uh, the upper stage vacuum engine is massively overpowered. Uh, this is it, Atlas. It can kick it Atlas into mission control orbit, into at T plus 23 instantly. minutes, 18 seconds and counting. We just heard but, confirmation of the second main engine start. Main engine cutoff 2 is planned to occur in approximately 5 minutes. Centaur PU system controlling uh, MR as expected. So, yeah, so so it is a lot of fuel. You're exactly right, Chris. Um, and chat says basically, yeah, that's that's a lot of a lot of fuel. The big thing is that uh, the hydrogen. So this is a really efficient. This is basically a sipping, a, an engine that just sips along nicely. The RL10. Um, but the big difference is once you're in space, uh, it you'd rather have an efficient engine than a high thrust engine. There's almost no case where you need a really high powered engine. Now passing 24 um, minutes into flight. You can just do a longer continuing burn. Continuing to perform well. Um, it can breath. be so low. Say you're trying to do like a, a Mars injection. And you're trying to actually break free of Earth's gravity, and you have to really line it up perfectly. You might have to do a couple passes, um, but for the most part, almost anything, you can just do a really, really long burn. But we will see. So yeah, so this will, um, <laughs> um, wait, what are, you, what are you guys like talking about here? Oh man, I can't wait for the, the next Falcon Heavy launch. That Since first one was crazy. Continuing to perform crazy. periodic thruster firings as expected. RCS line temps maintaining uh, close proximity to bottle temperatures. Seeing consistent tank pre pressures on uh, LH2 and LO2. Good. Tank pressures. And uh, hydrazine and helium storage bottle pressures also maintaining stable values. In other words, everything's good. Seeing good body rates on Centaur through this first burn. Now passing 25 minutes into flight. Um, Simon, I would probably, I'd answer you if you knew my name. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tim, not Todd. Um, and just over three minutes now remaining until Miko 2. So uh, the the very first, the Atia 1, I believe, used like a, um, what's that? Uh, uh, I think it's a little hybrid engine that used, um, gosh, what's that oxidizer that you can use? Uh, 
I can't remember. The the Atia from from Rocket Lab uh, used a, a little hybrid rocket engine. And we're it's about to announce really small. the answers and the winners to the game of trivia we held on Twitter shortly after liftoff of the Atlas V carrying AEHF-4. Major, are you ready to get started? Absolutely. Let's begin. <laughs> Question number one was, Ooh, the AEHF-4 probably... mission is the 50th mission ULA Wait, they doing has this launched before? for Did the they US. get main and second engine cut off? Okay, so, uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll think of it in a second. It was um, not Arizine. Uh, nitrous, uh, yeah, nitrous oxide or nitrogen peroxide? One of them. I don't remember exactly which one. Um, but, yeah, uh, so back to this real quick. <laughs> Todd Dodd would not be a good name. Um, so we had, we had a question, BFR versus SLS, I already have a video about that. I have a SpaceX versus, NAS vi uh, versus NASA video. Uh, I actually have two of them. And you need to watch the one first because it's, it's ridiculous to me that I say at the beginning of the second one, you have to watch the first one first, and everyone skips it. There are like 150,000 views on that one and 100,000 views on the one that came out first. You need to watch the one in order to understand the relationship of NASA and SpaceX. Um, but if you just need to know the rockets and how they compare, I have a video, NASA rockets versus SpaceX rockets. Check that out. You'll find out my exact answer to SLS versus BFR. Um, dude wants to know if I'm ever planning to do a KSP playthrough uh, where you get to the other solar systems, um, other, other star systems. I don't know if there isn't other star systems in Kerbal. There's other planetary bodies, which I like to do um what is that engine's thrust as far as th the uh, i hope i sorry i'm a little confused um dude are you talking about the uh the rl10 is a pretty low thrust it's like over 400 pounds um of or 400 seconds of specific impulse but i don't really remember uh what his actual thrust is uh we could probably look that up really quick though they are still burning. Here we go. They're probably going to come out of this burn any second. Um, you can go there with The mods. Air Force That's has an exciting announcement, and I'll let the video we're about to show speak for itself, but I'd like to say I'm pretty excited about the opportunity the Air Force is providing. Hey, we got a new member. Corn Doggo. I wouldn't say hi to Corn Doggo. Man, this is weird that they're showing videos of this close to Seco 2. Um... I, I, I want to know if it's going well. Actually, I really want to see views. Uh, SpaceX oftentimes shows views of the upper stage looking down. Uh, ULA tends to not do that. I would like to see more of that, though. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm trying to just keep up with you guys. Um, yeah. Oh. Visionary Q prize competition. I want a $100,000 prize. Ooh, they ended. And we're now approaching main engine cutoff two. Uh Oh, we've got confirmation that it has occurred. So main engine cutoff two has occurred. Okay, they call it main engine cutoff two. <laughs> there we go. Is it main engine cutoff two? I mean, I know they say it different. <laughs> oh, hello, Ben Solens. Everyone say hi to Ben. Uh, from Teslanomics pot, uh, from Teslanomics YouTube channel, he is also a co-host of our new podcast. I was in New Zealand this week and did it without them. Sounds like you guys needed me to talk space. Uh, it was a big, big, big space week, and yeah, a lot of stuff to talk about. Uh, I will be here this week uh, for sure. Uh, but Thursday, next Thursday's recording, we might have to do a little bit later, just a little bit. Um, I'll be down at space camp. I'm going to space camp next week. But uh, for those of you that, if you guys want a podcast about futurism, about space, about all of that stuff, um, look up our ludicrous future. I have the link below in the description. It, we have it. We post videos on YouTube. The vi the videos on YouTube are mostly meant to be used as a podcast. Um, but then you can also find us anywhere podcasts are available. It's a lot of fun. I really like it. I I'm with uh, Ben Solens, obviously, and Joe Scott from Answers with Joe. And um, you know what I you know what I find interesting? People get mad at me saying, "Why are you on a podcast?" With like, they might say Joe's negative and he and he and he's uh, pessimistic about certain programs and stuff. That's great, guys. Isn't that what you want? Isn't don't you want people with different voices and opinions on a podcast together? 
to me, that's what a, what makes a good podcast is hearing other opinions and not just an echo chamber of your own ideas. Um, that's one of the, the things that I like best. And of course, uh, Ben Solons, who is, um, he's a, a data analyst, a data scientist. Uh, we, he talks a lot about Tesla, uh, but I also talk a lot about Tesla. And then <laughs> Joe just got a, a Tesla. So we're the three Tesla, we're basically just like Tesla turds at this point. But I have a lot of fun with it anyway, so. Um, oh, sorry, dude. You were meeting with mods, other solar systems. There are, are good ones like Kerbal Star Systems. Stars even move independently from each other. That is crazy. Man, that sounds... Uh, man, that sounds really intimidating. I should look into that. And thank you, dude. You've been quite the contributor tonight. I really appreciate that. Um, so that's it for their stream tonight. I'm going to wrap mine up here too soon, guys, because I am very tired I have, like I said, I've said it a hundred times now, uh, I, I had a long, long, long day. I slept, you know, sleeping on a plane is never very fun, but stay tuned. I have a lot of content from uh, from Rocket Lab when I was down there in New Zealand. It was a ton of fun, made a lot of good friends, uh, met a lot of cool people. Um, so hi to all you Kiwis that I met. Thank you so much for showing me an awesome time. I really, really just, yeah, I can't wait to come back. I absolutely cannot wait to come back. Um... And I, I don't know, uh, Spooky wants to know if I'm doing uh, <laughs> Spooky Evan. Uh, <laughs> I realize everyone's going to have Spooky in the month of October, aren't you guys? Uh, wants to know if I'm going to be doing the Ariane 5 launch Friday. Maybe. I haven't done an Ariane launch yet. Um, it depends on what time of day. I'm out of town in the morning. Uh, depends on also if I get some videos done that I need to get done. Um, but yeah. Uh, Clay, thank you so much. And John C., you, you missed, I missed your last chat. Sorry, John. Oh, sorry. I I apologize, John. You're right. I absolutely did. Uh, will the Raptor engines be close to the efficiency as this engine? Uh, no, even, even a vacuum-optimized Raptor engine will still only be in the high 300s, and I believe the RL-10 is like 411 uh, as far as seconds of impulse. But that's not all that matters. Uh, that does matter quite a bit for some of the, you know, again, when you're in space... Um, but it's really, really, really hard to beat 411. Um, it's pretty darn crazy. Um, but yeah, the... Uh, oh, thanks, Archduke Tyler, talking about uh, our ludicrous future. But yeah, so... Uh, but yes, the, the... Sorry, I'll get... I'm like super scatterbrained. Uh, the Raptor engine, uh, even in its most efficient, will probably not be ever more efficient than a hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen engine uh, in a vacuum. Hydrogen is just really 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 efficient in a vacuum that being said raptors like uh, and methane rocket engines can be really efficient kind of like all around they're a good compromise between uh rp1 and and yeah um yeah guys i gotta get to bed i'm like i can't even talk anymore <laughs> mr sir <coughs> thank you for donating corn <laughs> to the uh Oh, you guys kill me sometimes. You guys are just ridiculous. What would I do without you? More corn? <laughs> I don't know. <coughs> is this a corn? Is this turning into a corn? A corn contest? <laughs> Jeez. Thank you, Riley. Thank you, Alex, for corn. Just because I live in Iowa, somehow this became the entire topic of all of our streams now on Discord. So if you want to talk about corn and how it could probably be rockets, you should probably consider becoming a Patreon member. <laughs> Patreon.com slash Everyday Astronaut. If there hasn't been a compelling reason until now, now you know. Now you know. Uh, I did want a real quick last reminder to check out my website. <laughs> Do a corn rocket shirt. That's not a bad idea, Paul. That might be the closest tie to corn I'd want to do. Jeez, John C. Corn, 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 corn. FR. Oh man. Thank you. Corn born to eat corn from Chris Harris. What is you guys are just ridiculous. Who are who are you people? <laughs> oh man. There's been so many corn jokes and very few of them are K O backwards R N, by the way. Um you know, got the life. I I used to love corn in like ninth grade. Uh, that corn. And Mr. Sir, commission someone to make a corn-shaped rocket. Here's my money for him. Make it merch. That would be great. I should do a 3D printed corn rocket that just says Everyday Astronaut. And it'll say corn up your life. 
You guys, jeez, Austin, uh, corn. Your family's from Iowa. Falcorn nine shirts. I'll probably do if I do anything Falcorn. It'll probably better be Falcorn heavy and be all three. Oh, you guys are making me do ridiculous things in life, and I love it. <laughs> jeez, go buy some corn. Yes, make a corn merch. Okay, be honest. I will be looking at this. How many people would honestly buy a corn t-shirt, a rocket corn t-shirt? I want to know right now. If I see, if I honestly see 20 people that, that swear, only say yes if you mean it. If you, if you actually want me to make a corn t-shirt, hold on. Let's see. Oh, geez. Oh, man. You guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mint sense says I would put it in my cart that never check out. That's funny. That's funny. Okay. I think I got everything I need to do. But again, guys, remember to check out my website where you can find pictures of Rocket Lab, which was a lot of fun. I had a ton of fun hanging out with Peter Beck uh, in his amazing factory. Uh, I'm really excited for Rocket Lab and what they're doing. Uh, mark my words, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with soon. Um, it's mostly pictures because I don't like to type very much. But then again, also remember you can check out pre-launch previews um, right here where you can see all upcoming flights, when they're going to take off, and yada, yada, yada. And while you're on my website, guys, speaking of shirts and merch, you can buy some cool shirts and merch right here. Um, this is my – everyone loves this one the best. The F1 Rocket Engine shirt. I get it. It's awesome. I'll have a lot of new shirts coming out very soon and a brand new web store. And uh, it'll be really, really, really good, I promise. Um, the new shirts will come in new packaging. So if you if you want to hold off and wait until the holiday season or something, I'll have it up very soon. Uh, it'll be really cool. There'll be a lot of new merch. But meanwhile, if you need something, everydayastronaut.com. Just check it out, guys. Check it out. And thank you, John C. Oh, I got to go to bed. I am way too tired. You guys are hilarious, and thank you so much. Chris, if you grow corn, no, no, we're not starting, we're not starting Todd. That is not a thing, please, seriously, uh, 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 on the Todd. Uh, thank you, guys. You guys are great. I appreciate all your time. I have to go to bed. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Bye, everybody.